I'll be reading from Matthew 7, 28 through 8, 13 in the NIV. If you want to look along in the pew Bibles, it's on page 1178. When Jesus had finished saying these things, the crowds were amazed at his teaching because he taught as one who had authority and not as their teachers of the law. When Jesus came down from the mountainside, large crowds followed him. A man with leprosy came and knelt before him and said, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. Jesus reached out his hand and touched the man. I am willing, he said, be clean. Immediately he was cleansed of his leprosy. Then Jesus said to him, See that you don't tell anyone, but go show yourself to the priest and offer the gift Moses commanded as a testimony to them. When Jesus, Jesus said to him, Shall I come and heal him? The centurion replied, Lord, I do not deserve to have you come under my roof, but just say the word and my servant will be healed. For I myself am a man under authority, with soldiers under me, I tell this one go, and he goes, and that one come, and he comes. I say to my servant, do this, and he does it. When Jesus heard this, he was amazed and said to those following him, truly I tell you, I have not found anyone in Israel with such great faith. I say to you that many will come from the east and the west and will take their places at the feast with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. But the subjects of the kingdom will be thrown outside into the darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then Jesus said to the centurion, go, let it be done just as you believed it would. And his servant was healed at that moment. This is the word of the Lord. Let's pray again together. Oh, Lord Jesus, how we thank you that this morning when we come into this place, and when we hear these words, they, they are more than just words on a page. This is part of your deep desire to know us personally, to walk with us, to help us navigate through the ins and outs of life. So now we pray that you'll take these words inspired by your Holy Spirit, written by your servant Matthew, and may they come alive to us, we pray. Amen. What would it be like if we could have been there when a man with leprosy came up to Jesus and said, Jesus, if you're willing to do it, you can make it make me cleaner. What would it have been like for us if we had been near to Jesus when a powerful centurion, do you know he oversaw a hundred Roman soldiers, the occupiers, came to Jesus and said, Jesus, would you, would you heal my servant? He's paralyzed. And Jesus said, sure, I'll come. And then the centurion says the unbelievable. He says, you don't need to come to my home. All you need to do is say the word and he will be healed. And, and Jesus says, how could this be? And, and the centurion says, well, you know, when I give an order to one of my men, it's like it was done. And when I receive an order, I don't ask any questions. It's my job to do it. And if you say the word, it will be done. What would it be like if we could be there? That's what Matthew wants us to be able to do. You know, part of the reason why we had the reading begin at the end of chapter 7 was I wanted us to get a feel for how people reacted when they heard Jesus teach the teachings that we call the Sermon on the Mount. They were so impressed. They realized here was a power beyond the power of the church, beyond the power of religion or anything else in the world. Matthew wants us to get a feel for that. 
And you know, unfortunately, that doesn't happen every day for everyone who calls himself a follower of Jesus Christ. Um, I remember reading the book by Philip Yancey called The Jesus I Never Met. That's the reason you get the title today. And he talks about growing up in a Christian home, of wanting to love Jesus, and then coming to the place in life where he realized all that he knew didn't begin to express who Jesus was. I mean, Jesus will really, he will upset your life, but it'll all be for good. He will turn things around, but it all will be that for which you were created to do. So how do we come to the place where we can know this Jesus? It's the reason why during these Lenten weeks, I'd like to take us into these events from the life of Christ, where the gospel writer in each case specifically said that Jesus physically touched someone. I just want us to have to get a hold of the fact that he, what Jesus was real. He was a human being. Yes, the God-man, but a human being. And the gospel writers on certain occasions realized it was so important that they specifically said Jesus reached out and touched the person. I want us to be able to, to, be able to reflect on all of what that means for the kind of world we live in and the needs that we have for ourselves. Because if we reflect on that reality, then there's far more chance that we're going to release to Jesus the troubles that we have, most of which pale in comparison to the sorts of things that happen to other people in the world. But frankly, sometimes they don't. Sometimes what we face is as heavy as it gets. And what, what, what we need, what I need, what we all need to be able to realize that is in the middle of those things, the Jesus who we call our leader is a Jesus big enough to deal with anything that we have to deal with. You know, he wants to bring us to the place where we can reflect on his great love for every human being. Uh, touching this man with leprosy was not your everyday kind of an occurrence back in the time of Jesus. Um, if you couldn't get within six feet of somebody with leprosy, talk about social distancing. Or if the wind was blowing in the wrong direction, 150 feet. If a person with leprosy came into your home, every part of your home was unclean. I'm not sure all of what they did, but it wasn't good under those circumstances. And Jesus hears this man cry out with faith, Lord, if you're willing, you can make me clean. If you want to do it, you can make me clean. And Jesus says, in touching him, this is beautiful, in the act of touching him, he says, I am willing, because of your faith you are clean. And you know, normally a person would be, you know, you'd be unclean yourself if you touched the leper. But you tell me, was Jesus unclean? How, how quickly did the healing take place? Did it take place quickly enough so all the rules were out the window? Uh, Jesus was a respecter of certain parts of the religion of that day. He noticed in the text, perhaps, that he then asked the leper to go, the man with leprosy, to go through the normal process of proving he was clean. What God wants is for us to be able to reflect on this awesome love of Jesus. He wants us to, to be able to reflect on, on how much Jesus understands what's going on in our lives. I think that's part of the significance of this account with the centurion. The amazing account. I mean, there aren't too many times in the New Testament where, where the writer tells us that Christ was amazed. There are only a few times, and this is one of them. He was so amazed because this 
this centurion believed the word of Jesus would create something, create healing. Um, and and he, he wants us to have that kind of appreciation for how much he can work in our lives and how much he understands what's going on in our lives. Um, I think part of the time our struggle with uh, believing God's going to do something is he seems so far away. Could he understand my depression? I mean, you answer me. Can he understand our depression? I mean, we, we, we live in a, a, a time when depression is rampant. And does he understand that? Well, if you're depressed, you probably have a very hard time believing that. And I imagine most Christians have a hard time believing it, but let me tell you, it's true. There's nothing. The writer of the Hebrews tells us there is nothing we could experience that Christ has not experienced something similar to it. So he understands. So if he loves and he understands, the real question is, is he going to do anything about it? Well, Matthew wants to say to us I, that, that Jesus is just ready to do something about it. He has no greater desire than to enter into our challenges of life and make good out of the tough. You know, one advantage that uh, Sylvia and I have, and incidentally, we just had the greatest welcome here. If you're new here this Sunday, this is only our second Sunday in the church. It was interesting to drive down to the church today. We actually knew how to get here. Um, <laughs> we've just had the greatest welcome. Thank you. But, um, you know, one of the advantages of being older that now than I used to be is that we've walked with Jesus. Some of you know we, we had some struggle about, about moving here to the, the Northwest for these months. Not that we didn't want to live here and not that we didn't feel like this was perhaps what Jesus wanted us to do. Uh, and in fact, that's the reason that uh, we'll be going back to Kentucky. Uh, hopefully you'll not notice it, but uh, we'll be back in Kentucky, Sylvia more than me, because we have some, uh, some really significant family responsibilities back there. Uh, we have, for the last five years, lived within a mile, as the crow flies, of all nine of our grandkids. Our three children, their spouses, all nine of our grandkids. And the youngest of the grandchildren is the princess, Liliana. Just two years old, if you've been around a two-year-old lately, you know, especially if you're a grandparent, they are golden because all, all of their bad stuff they do with their parents. The terrible twos does not normally happen at the grandparents. So one day a week, Sylvia's the child care for Liliana, and then in the afternoon when the boys come home from school, they show up at our house. So she will be spending a good share of the time back there doing that, but we really wrestled with this. It was like... A, Two competing values. The value of, yeah, this is something that would be good, and we believe probably God wants us to do it, but this is something that's equally good, and we've already said we'll do it. So how do you deal with that? Well, part of it is that when, you've, when you're older than you used to be, if you've walked with Jesus, I mean, this is the wonderful thing about, about really um, experimenting with God. Because he will always come through. I mean, I, I don't mean testing him, doing crazy things. I mean, when, when you are convinced that he's asking you to do it, just figure out how, not whether. And, and then he will prove his reliability. And then when another challenge comes later, it doesn't mean it won't be difficult, but you will have already had the experience. You have already, many of you know what I'm talking about here because you've done it. Um, so when we had to deal with this particular issue, fortunately, we could flip back about, uh, about 20 years, uh, about 20 years ago when 
our denomination was saying, would you move to Indianapolis from Rochester, New York, and become the executive director of Free Methodist World Missions? And so we th prayed about it. It seemed like it was what God wanted us to do. But that was the year. The year we would have moved would have been the year that our son Matt would have begun his senior year in high school. And he was part of the kind of youth group that you would move, you would at least be inclined to move across the country to have your, your child, your senior, your high school student be a part of. I mean, just that kind of good, solid Christian friends and spiritual stimulation. And so here we are wrestling with this, two competing values. And in fact, I can always, re all, all often remember uh, we were working on this, and it seemed like this was what we were supposed to do, and we had talked to Matt about it, and, uh, but, but we hadn't told him it looks like this is what's going to happen. And so I remember we are in a restaurant, we had, had dessert, and we, we were saying, you know, Matt, it looks like this is what God's calling us to do, but, but we don't really like what this may cost you. And, um, and tell us what you're thinking, and I will never forget his response. I can quote it to this day. He said, Dad, if that's what God tells you to do, you'd better do it. Well, that didn't make it easy, but I tell you, there was a release in that. I mean, like, we, I didn't know how we could ask him to move to Indianapolis and become part of a high school with a thousand students in their senior class and no friends it's just almost impossible, but you know, God never lets us down. The wonderful, I cannot tell you all the story, but the wonderful way that it all worked out was uh, his sister, our daughter Michelle, and her husband were at Asbury Seminary, and so he, along with their firstborn, who was about a year old, Ian, so Matt, for that year, moved to Kentucky, he went back into the same school system, large, but nowhere near as large as an Indianapolis high school. The same school system he had left in second grade, kids remembered him. Or maybe their parents did and reminded them, I'm not sure. He had such a good senior year that although we had set it up he could finish in a semester, he decided to spend the whole year there. And the best part of it all was toward the end of the year, he got to know this, uh, this beautiful, godly young woman named Anna Lee. And a couple years later, we got to celebrate a wedding for them. And she's now his wife, the mother of their kids, our daughter-in-law. And in fact, I smiled and said, it's almost like Anna Lee is a gift from Free Methodist World Missions. Would they ever have met if it had not been for that call of God. See, Matthew wants us to understand this God who created the world, who created you, who wants to walk with you. He is all loving, all powerful, understands completely, and today he wants to make a powerful difference in your life, and it's all because of the touch, his touch of love in your life. And he wants to change the way your mind works as far as life is concerned. That there is not a problem that's too big for him. There's not an issue that he can't turn around for its good. Romans 8.28 speaks an eternal truth that God works in all things for good for those who love him and are called according to his purposes. We want to again this morning celebrate Holy Communion together. And as you do that, you might think about those uh, questions for discussion and reflection. You know, we have them each week. One of them for today will be, uh, what, what miracle of Jesus would you most like to have been present for? Was it the feeding of the 5,000, bringing Lazarus back from the dead, healing of the man with leprosy? I mean, the list goes on and on and on. 
So which one would you like to be there for? And can you imagine yourself in the middle of that incident? I just think that's so exciting to even think about it. There, our imaginations are so powerful. We, God can use us to move us right into that. Or, or one of the other questions, uh, uh, which one of the miracles of Jesus do you think best communicates his love? And then, as you, we take communion this morning, what need of your life is too big for you to carry yourself? Um, maybe you've not admitted it to anybody else, and quite frankly, it may not be necessary, although there's, there's great health in having somebody else walk through our troubles with us. But what need would you like to give to him? Because you see, he is present in the bread and in the juice. Spiritually, this is a remembrance, but this is also a celebration of who he is and how powerful he is in our world today. Give those needs to him. Let's pray together. Lord, how we thank you for the reality of your grace. It is just too big for us, but it also fits us perfectly. And Lord, if we had a choice, we'd love to be there present when you did some of these awesome, awesome, awesome things. And we know in a way we can be. And Lord, there are needs of our lives. Maybe they don't look big to other people, but they certainly look big to us. Or maybe they're so private that if we shared them with somebody else, they would be aghast. But they're not too big for you. Now as we celebrate together this marvelous, marvelous moment, would you speak to our hearts? and live anew in our lives. Would you pray with me the Lord's Prayer? Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom, the glory, the glory forever. Amen.